I love a darker dial in a 6265. So in the steel range, sorry, I just, I just touched the microphone. Hey guys, it is Cam with Craft and Tailored. And in this episode of what is on my wrist, we are talking about a yellow gold Rolex Daytona reference 6265 from 1985. This is an exceptional example. It is probably one of the nicest yellow gold reference 6265s that I've ever seen. It just so happens that this one is a black dial instead of the more commonly seen champagne dials. And it's been spending some time on the wrist. Um, this one most likely is not gonna make it to the website. I had a client that came into the office the other day and saw it on my desk as I was writing a, a listing up on it and kind of just Googling it and Googling it and fondling it and whatever you wanna call it and was like, I have to have that watch. He's a great friend and a, and a pretty serious collector of ours, so I'm happy that it's gonna go to a new home. But before we pass it on to its new owner, I wanted to just kind of highlight this example, share it with you, as it is definitely kind of a case study example for what a yellow gold Daytona should definitely look like. It's a little bit later in the production run, and has some key features that I really like about this example specifically, and was worthy of some time on the wrist. So let's get into the details, shall we? You like that? I gave my, our other series, The Details, a plug. If you guys aren't following that series, be sure to do that. We just did a really awesome episode with Donnie Calloway um, in which we talked about vintage Ferraris out in the middle of the desert, so it's awesome. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to stay up to date on the latest uh, elements of content and videos from your favorite team here at Craft & Tailored. All right, so let's talk about 6265s. Um, we've reviewed the Rolex Daytona reference 6265 in other videos. We'll provide a link up here or down below so that you can check that out. But what's interesting is that, you know, this is a sports watch. It is considered a tool watch, even though this specific example is in 18 karat yellow gold. You know, it's not overly weighty, but it definitely is a chunk of gold. And having one in this condition is, is really becoming a, a, a hard thing to find and also something that um, is definitely in the collector kind of blue chip watch category. One of the things that I think is, is you know, interesting is that for a long time, the gold variants weren't really trading at that much more of a premium than their steel counterpoints. So you could actually find yellow gold Daytonas and yellow gold subs and things like that for slightly more than their counterparts in steel. But ultimately, as a result of kind of the internet and auction catalogs and all that kind of stuff, what we've seen is that there is a small number of yellow gold examples in the sport range compared to the steel ones. And I think the collector market kind of realized that maybe five or six years ago where they were like, oh, wait a minute, why is this only, you know, 15, 20% more expensive than a steel variant? It should be a lot more expensive. And now we're seeing about a 40 to 45% difference in terms of price for a yellow gold example, not considering condition or anything like that. So kind of an interesting um, piece of horological history. Let's talk a little bit about the 6265, give you like a little bit of a refresher. If you haven't uh, checked out our other videos on the vintage four digit Daytona range, starting with the 6239 and moving into like the 6263, 6265s and in steel, I would encourage you, to guys, you guys to check those videos out. I'll provide a, a link in the description below and up here so that you guys can kind of check that out. So let's talk about the difference between uh, a Rolex Daytona 6265 and a Rolex Daytona 6263. The major difference between the two references is the bezel, essentially. A 6263 is gonna have an acrylic bezel, whereas a 6265 is gonna have a tone-on-tone -tone bezel, meaning that if it's in steel, the 6265 is going to have a steel bezel as opposed to a steel bezel with an acrylic insert. Now there's a lot of different dial variations and a lot of different mark variants and also both 6263s and 6265s were produced in both stainless steel, 14 karat yellow gold, and then 18 karat yellow gold. Basically the US market was not really recognizing 18K. It was more popular and more common to buy watches in the 14 karat yellow gold range back in the uh, early part of the 1970s and also into the 1960s. So that's why you'll see Rolex Daytonas in both 14K and 18K when we're looking at the yellow gold references. Same thing for the 6263. 
moving into the 6263 and 6265, um, you know, in 1971, Rolex was transitioning away from the 6241 and the 6239 and ultimately moving into what we would call the screw down Daytonas or the Oyster Daytonas. And what that means is Rolex basically upgraded the pushers and the crowns on their Daytonas to um, basically offer uh, a watch that was uh, waterproof. Prior to that, with the exception of the Rolex Daytona reference 6240, which is, I guess, a bit of a hybrid, the 6240 was produced in stainless steel, but it really wasn't until 1971 that Rolex was producing the Oyster uh, you know, Daytona. The 6263 and the 6265 lasted all the way up until about 1988. So fairly long production run for the Oyster you know, Day Daytonas. Obviously moving into the Zenith series and then into the current production lines, every Daytona is now waterproof and Oyster. So they all have the locking pushers and the, and the screw down crown. So let's talk a little bit about the 6265 and talk a little bit about the tech specs of the watch. What's interesting about yellow gold Daytonas and yellow gold sport watches is that Rolex actually produced this Oyster Rivet bracelet for a really long time. This is kind of more of a classic and I guess what you could say is vintage bracelet. In the 80s, Rolex obviously upgraded their bracelet in the steel watches to be non-rivet bracelets, which are a little bit more modern and contemporary, but ultimately we're finding that Rolex actually produced the Oyster rivet bracelet for quite a long time, uh, especially if they were coming out of Switzerland. So this example, even though it was produced in 85, does retain an Oyster rivet bracelet, which is factory original to this piece. And then additionally, the bracelet does taper down to 16 millimeters at the clasp. So the bracelet is a reference 7205 with 71 end pieces. This bracelet obviously is an 18K because this is an 18K 6265. And it's kind of interesting that Rolex kept this Oyster Rivet bracelet, which you would more commonly find on earlier references out of the 1970s, even out of the late 1960s in the steel variants where Rolex kind of upgraded those steel bracelets, but yet carried over this Oyster Rivet, which I actually really like. The specifics on this bracelet are pretty incredible. There isn't much stretch here and it kind of, is copacetic with, with the other elements of this watch. The bezel is unpolished, the case is unpolished, the crown and the pushers are in really sharp condition. The case overall on this example is really on point. It's an amazing example overall. Some people have a preference on the dial coloration. For me specifically, I like a darker dial when you have a tone on tone bezel. I think it kind of presents the watch as being larger. What's interesting is the mid case of a 6265 is actually 36 millimeters. Most people say the watch is 40 millimeters or 38 or whatever, but the mid case, if you measure it, it's actually 36 millimeters, but yet wears larger and more substantial because you have this seven millimeter, um, you know, trip lock crown. And then you also have these larger screw down pushers. And as you can see on wrist, the watch wears substantial, but not oversized, if that makes sense. Obviously, being that it's a 6265, just like a 6263, we've got a Rolex caliber 727 in the case. It's a manually wound chronograph movement. So obviously it wasn't until you know 1988 when Rolex released the Zenith Daytona that they were leveraging an automatic or self-winding movement. But I really love the four-digit Daytonas. Uh, case in point, I love, I love winding them. You know, I think there's something that is kind of romantic about putting your energy into the piece and not to get too hippie woo woo. There's something charming about, you know, mechanically wound chronographs. I, I'm a big fan of them. So nothing against Zenith lovers. I also love a Zenith Daytona, but um, there's just something special about, you know, yellow gold 6265s and or 6263s uh, in, you know, the four digit range, which are mechanical. So super awesome watches. But this watch in particular is absolutely stunning. A little bit of darkening of the loom plots. One thing that I'll kind of give you an insider tip on is typically the loom plots at the three, the six, and the nine on the dial are gonna see the most degradation. And the reason why is there isn't any marker that butts up against that loom plot to kind of protect it from degradation. So if the dial has been removed from the case at a service interval, in some cases the dial can actually show degradation as a result of those loom plots kind of just floating out there and being exposed. And that's at the three, the six, and the nine. 
This remains in flawless condition. Overall, this is a 10 out of 10 example. So that's ultimately why I wanted to share it with you guys. So I'll provide a link in the description below. We'll probably post this on the website just so that we can kind of show it as a reference example. But overall, this is an amazing watch and really wanted to talk about yellow gold 6265s or just yellow gold sport watches in the Daytona range specifically. But um, this thing is just, it's awesome. Uh, on wrist, it's just, I mean, I don't know if it gets better than that. It's beautiful. So in any case, thanks for tuning in, guys. If you haven't done so already, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That really helps us out. If you're not doing so already, follow us on Instagram at Craft and Tailored. And if you've got watch questions, we're here and happy to help. Drop us a line at info at craftandtailored.com. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Uh...